from our witnesses. Our first witness will be Michael Posner, Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy and Human Rights and Labor. A second panel will be Dr. Robert George, Commissioner, United States Commissioner on International Religious Freedom. And the panel three will be uh, Vo Van I, founder and president of Action for Democracy in Vietnam, along with the wife of the imprisoned Vietnamese American, uh, Nguyen Qua Quan, and also Fu Du Nguyen, Vice President of Saigon Broadcasting Television Net uh, Network. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary Posner, we welcome you uh, to, the, to the hearing. Uh, <clears throat> Your full statement will appear in the record, and you can summarize as go as you, you, you see fit. Thank you, uh, Chairman Wolf, and thank you for holding uh, this important hearing. Um, I want to um, respond in, in a sense to your opening comments by um, at least focusing uh, on the places where we agree. Um, we agree that uh, in Vietnam today, respect for human rights uh, continues to deteriorate as it has for the past several years. Uh, these are issues of great concern to the United States government, to me personally, to our ambassador there, and to the secretary. I want to outline four areas where we are raising concerns on a regular basis and say a bit more about what we're trying to do and how, we, how this fits into the broader relationship with Vietnam. Uh, to begin with, uh, when we talk about human rights and what it ma means to us, um, I think we need to keep reminding ourselves that these issues are much more significant to Vietnamese people themselves, especially young people. They want to live in an open society. They want to be linked to the rest of the world. They want to be able to share their ideas freely to have the ability to practice democracy. We support their aspirations and our efforts to publicize the human rights problems there are part of our effort to amplify their voices. So let me focus on the four areas. First, Vietnam continues to unjustly detain and imprison individuals for exercising their basic human rights. We estimate the government holds about 100 prisoners of conscience. Uh, Nguyen Van He, who also goes, goes by the name of uh, Du K. Uh, has been detained since October of 2010 without charge, uh, I, rather on a charge of propagandizing against the state, a charge that stems from his blogging. Um, he's already served a sentence for politically motivated tax evasion charges. He's not alone. Uh, Lei Kong Din worked as a lawyer defending journalists, human rights activists, internet writers, uh, he, and he was convicted in January of 2010 for spreading propaganda against the state. Father Lee, a Catholic priest whose case you followed very closely and one of the principal architects of the democracy movement, has been repeatedly detained and released since 1977. He was most recently released on medical parole in March of 2010, but then again uh, imprisoned in July of last year. We are continuing to call for his con unconditional release and working on behalf of these and many other prisoners. This is an ongoing problem and an important one. Uh, secondly, the, the threat to freedom extends beyond politically motivated detentions. Uh, there is a growing restriction on the free flow of information, both in the print media, on television, and via the internet. There are a number of recent decrees and decisions that stifle an already restricted press. Uh, last February, they, the government issued a new decree, number two, which allows for greater censorship and punishment of the media for any material deemed to be, and I'm quoting here, against the interests of the state. Another regulation, <coughs> Decree 20, would limit access of Vietnamese citizens to television stations. And we're closely following a third decree, a draft decree, that may be promulgated next month, um, which would uh, restrict uh, access to internet content and provide a set of new um, restrictions against internet providers. We're following this closely, and we're, we will make our views known to the government of uh, Vietnam uh, more specifically. 
A third broad issue concerns uh, legal provisions that are vague and inconsistent with international norms and that allow the government to target citizens at will. I'll just mention two. Article 79 outlaws activities that are aimed at overthrowing the people's administration. In practice, this law has been interpreted very broadly and targets, for example, those um, who in many other societies would be recognized as peaceful protesters. Article 88 uh, outlaws propaganda against the state and can be used, as we recently learned, even against a musician who posted a political song on the Internet. We've called for the repeal of these vague laws and will continue to do so. Fourth and finally, in an area that you've spent so much time focused on, and rightly so, are the restrictions that limit religious freedom in Vietnam. Um, we're very concerned about harassment of Christian groups, disputes with Buddhist groups, difficulties that multiple religious groups face in registering, gathering, practicing their faith freely. Although Vietnam's constitution and laws guarantee freedom of religion, these laws are not applied consistently. And in particular, in the various discussions I've had with the Vietnamese government, um, we have uh, raised consistently the slow progress in the registration of churches for Protestant congregations in the Northwest Highlands. We've also raised concerns that the Bible has yet to be translated into modern Hmong language. Uh, although the government has registered some churches in the past several years, the pace of registrations has remained slow and unacceptable in our judgment. I want to close with these thoughts. We continue to view the situation of human rights discouraging and unacceptable. Our government officials are repeatedly raising these issues. I did in a human rights dialogue last fall. We followed up and our am ambassador has followed up repeatedly. We've made it clear to the government of Vietnam that a, a, our joint desire to have a more uh, a closer strategic relationship is dependent on their making substantial progress on human rights. We are not satisfied that that's happening. We continue to raise these issues. Secretary Clinton continues to raise these issues, as do others in the department. So we stand with you, uh, Chairman Wolf, in terms of our assessment of what's happening. Um, and I, I would only say that um, this is a, uh, an issue of great importance. It's central to our relationship with Vietnam, and it will continue to be so. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, would you give them, if you had to grade them now, would you give them an A, B, C, D, or an F? Mm. Um, I, I think the you know, we don't tend to grade governments, but the grade would How would you be personally grade them? I would grade them an F, so I'm just curious. <laughs> hey, from your own... I know you didn't talk about this at the State Department last night, you went over, but how would you grade them? I would personally? grade them as unacceptable. The conditions are unacceptable, and we will continue to raise these concerns until uh, conditions change. Okay. Uh, I, I hear from the Vietnamese community, uh, they're not happy with the American ambassador. Why doesn't the American ambassador, and can you give us a commitment that on July 4th, uh, if we remember Philadelphia, July 4th, 1776, the Liberty Bill. And we all know that Ronald Reagan said that the words in the Constitution, which were signed in Philadelphia in the hot summer of 1787, and also Ronald Reagan said the words in the Declaration of Independence was a covenant not only with the people in Philadelphia in 1776 and in 1787, a hot summer, but it was really, Reagan said, that they were a covenant with the entire world. So basically, uh, I believe, as President Reagan did, that they were basically a covenant with all the people, the people of China, but also the people today in Vietnam. Could you give us a commitment, or would you direct your ambassador over there to kick the doors open of the American embassy on July 4th and invite all the dissidents and all of their families and all of the Buddhists who are being persecuted and uh, all the Catholics who are being persecuted uh, all of the bloggers and whereby the American embassy would overflow with freedom, frankly, whereby similar to what mm. uh, Secretary Bush did, uh, uh, rather Secretary Schultz used to do, and also Secretary Baker. Would you commit here that the American ambassador will do that on this 4th of July as we're fast approaching? 
Uh, I, I want to answer that. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, in a position to say what's going to happen on the 4th of July, but I want to make a larger point that answers your question. Um, I have been, uh, I, I, my mandate is to work on all of the world, and there are a range of places where I have uh, greater challenges in getting um, uh, everybody within our government to be on the same uh, page in terms of how important the human rights piece is in a larger agenda. <clears throat> With respect to Vietnam, I would say that Secretary Clinton has gone out of her way to engage me and include me in her senior meetings on this subject. I've had repeated contacts with Ambassador Scheer about these issues, and he has reinforced my instincts about what we need to do in these cases. Um, uh, Deputy Secretary Burns has visited Vietnam. The Secretary, Secretary Clinton has vi visited Vietnam. We've repeatedly made it clear to the government of Vietnam that the strategic relationship which they desire and we desire for a range of other reasons is being held up because of the deteriorating and poor human rights record of the government. That is a consistent message, and I'm, I'm very confident that the government of Vietnam is hearing from a range of U.S. officials that we stand behind Vietnamese citizens who are pushing for democracy and human rights. But you acknowledge in your testimony that conditions are worse. They're, they're, they're not better in spite of the activity. What would be... What harm would there be for on this July 4th that we have the American Embassy invite all of the dissidents and all of the families of the dissidents to come to the American Embassy? All of the bloggers, all the young people, all the people that thirst for freedom, the Buddhist monks, the Catholic priests, whereby to, to replicate what used to be done by, quite frankly, the Carter administration, so it is a bipartisan, what would be uh, uh, blessed by Scoop Jackson, one of the finest senators we have had here in the United States Senate in uh, in the in the 20th century? We remember Jackson Vanek, and we remember that. Uh, we remember what President Reagan did, and and George Shultz, and and Jim Baker did. Why couldn't we replicate that? Because when you would go, when I would go to Romania. The American ambassador in Romania in 84 and 85 would literally invite in the dissidents and they would even say, I'm honored to be here. And even they would say, by being here with the ambassador and with everyone else, it basically offers a protection. So if we can achieve anything out of this hearing, why, what would be wrong with the ambassador being told, this 4th of July, let's really open the doors and invite all the freedom-loving people to come in and celebrate what President Reagan said was a covenant with the entire world. Uh, what, what would be wrong with that, Michael? I mean, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time why you wouldn't just embrace this thing and say, wow, this is a great idea. We're gonna, I mean, what would be wrong? Let me, first of all, I will take back your suggestion and raise it directly with the ambassador. But I think the broader point you're making with which I agree is that we do ourselves proud when we reach out to dissident communities and activists and make it clear that we are going to amplify their voices, provide them support and protection. <clears throat> My experience with our embassy in Vietnam is that they spend time and energy doing that. They, when I visited there, I had uh, access to a number of activists uh, who were very, very familiar with, knew the embassy officials extremely well. We've had very active political officers there, and the ambassador is active on these issues. Again, it's not uniformly the case throughout the world, but I do think this is a case where we have an embassy that is highly attentive to these issues. And so the broader concern you have, which I share, is that the United States ought to be clearly uh, working to support those who are nonviolent critics of the government who want to raise issues of human rights and democracy and who are embattled and endangered because of their advocacy. We've made it very clear to the government of Vietnam that w that's where we stand and we're going to continue to do that. Well, I appreciate that. Words are important, uh, but the deeds that would go with it, and I think those deeds, quite frankly, uh, I. <clears throat> Uh, let me just say it for the record, you may disagree. If the ambassador fails to do that this 4th of July, then I think he'll go down in history 
as a total and complete failure. I just think it's important to say that. I mean, when I think of an American citizen and all the Vietnamese activists who come in to see me really don't have very positive things to, to say, and they really don't view the American embassy as a friendly place. Yet in the minds that we see in China, Chen didn't go to the Portuguese embassy, he didn't go to the Spanish embassy, he went to the American embassy. And I think there's been a bipartisan, the name of this commission is the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, and there's been a bipartisan acceptance of doing those. So I would hope on the 4th of July, and we'll check and see uh, what happens on the 4th of July. Um, I will convey your great. request. Thank you. Uh, just two other questions. Given the continuing abuses you've outlined, unjust detentions, restrictions on free flow of information, use of vague security laws to silence dissent, dissent, restrictions on religious freedom, what is the State Department's reluctance on designating Vietnam as a CPC? You know, I, I, this is a uh, process, as you know, that's ongoing. We made designations of eight countries last fall. Um, we will review those designations. We can add or subtract countries from the list at any time. Uh, our impression is that um, among the range of issues that I raised, um, the, the issues relating to registration of churches and other things um, uh, of, of concern on, uh, in terms of religious freedom, the situation has not gotten better, but it's at a sort of steady state. We continue to press, for example, for uh, more church registrations. There, the churches are registering, but at way too slow a rate. Um, we've gotten promises from the Vietnam, Vietnamese government that they're going to accelerate that. They've, they have not done so, so we're going to continue to push for that. We've gotten promises for two years that they're going to translate the Bible into Hmong language. They have not done that. We're going to continue to press for it. But the situation is at a static state, whereas on issues like these political imprisonments or on, on uh, media freedom, there's a, there's a strong negative uh, trajectory. So those are issues that we're very focused on at this moment. We're focused on all the issues, but at this moment, we have not designated Vietnam as a country of particular concern. And yet you may? It is an open process, and we can make a judgment at any time. We made a judgment last fall <clears throat> to put eight countries on that list. It has to be reviewed periodically, and we will continue to receive information from the uh, Commission on Religious Freedom and others, and we will take it into consideration. When will that decision be made? There is no time, there's no deadline for it. Uh, uh, we have to do it, I think, every, at least every two years, um, but we're certainly going to look at Vietnam. We are looking at it on an ongoing basis. Uh, the last question <coughs> that I have is, what has the State Department done in regards to the imprisoned Vietnamese American, Dr. Nguyen Quoc Quan. Has any progress been made in order to secure his release? Uh, as, as you said at the outset, uh, uh, he is an American citizen who was detained uh, on his arrival uh, in Vietnam last month. Uh, counselor officials uh, have been uh, closely uh, monitoring the case. I, I just met uh, uh, his wife uh, just before this hearing began, and. And I know that she's been in contact, constant contact with, with our counselor officials. I think she's going to testify to that effect. Um, I can't say much more because of Privacy Act limitations, but you can be assured we are highly attentive to this and doing everything we can. Do they uh, visit? Has the ambassador tried to visit him in jail? I, I can't say that. Boy, I, you know, if, if the ambassador hasn't tried to visit him in jail, Michael, if you were the ambassador in Vietnam, I, I will test that you would have tried to visit him in jail. I just asked the staff to call, to call the embassy today and ask if, if the ambassador tried to visit him. If the ambassador hasn't tried to visit an American citizen, I, I, I just, I mean, maybe we're on just a different page. Maybe... Boy, we would have never defeated communism. The 80s would have been a totally different. We hadn't had people like Scoop Jackson and Tom Lantos and Henry Hyde. I mean, so if they haven't tried to visit him, I mean, do you, do you, do you know that he, that he tried? Is that, is, I mean, is, what, what, <clears throat> what is the secrecy? I don't quite understand why 
Can you tell us if you try to visit them? I don't understand why that. Well, works. there are two different things here. What I've said is that uh, council officials have been uh, actively engaged in this and uh, have had contact with them. And again, I'm going to let his wife uh, speak to this. But under the Privacy Act, this is an American citizen, and there's a limit in what I can say in a public setting. I'm glad to talk to you offline. I'm glad to get more information and come back to you about who's visited and what uh, circumstance. We are very attentive to this case. We're very uh, conscious of his situation. This has happened in the last few weeks. How's his health? Uh, I, I think, again, I, I'd rather if, we, if you allow me, let me go back and get more information on exactly where things are, and I'm glad to talk to you privately, but I'm, I'm constrained by the Privacy Act in terms of well, talking about particular. I don't understand that. that that's, this is the first time I ever heard about the Privacy Act prohibiting it. Uh, have you met with his wife? Have you taken a time to sit down with her away from you know, the hearing room and, 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 and meet with her to find out? And, and uh, I mean, the same way that you would want if, you know, if, if your dad were in prison or your uncle or brother or husband or wife, have you, ha has, has the State Department sat down with her? Have, have, is, is the wife here? She, yeah. she is. Has, and we just met. Has, has anyone from the State Department spent time with you to talk to you about your husband? But have, has anyone in Washington spoken with you? No one in Washington has spoken. And how, how long has your husband been in jail? Um, he's been in jail since 17, April 17. Is that a right? And no one in Washington, has anyone in Washington spoken to you on the phone? No one. Have you spoken to the American ambassador? But has the American ambassador taken time to be in touch with you? And is your husband an American citizen? Well, Michael, I tell you, if this administration doesn't push this, you are basically endangering every American citizen that goes to these dictatorial dictator countries. You should be meeting with her today. When are you, when are you leaving town? This is her husband. I, I'm, I I mean, Congressman Wolf, I would be happy casual. to meet with her. I met her just before this hearing but, began. But you should, you should take time this afternoon. Would you take time to, to sit? Do you have time here. to meet with the Assistant Secretary this afternoon? I will, yeah, I, I will see the State Department today. But who, who, who is, uh, he's the most important person. He's the Assistant Secretary. Would you meet with him? Absolutely. Okay, happy good. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Assistant Secretary Posner, for your testimony. And, you know, the committee will keep following it. We'll also call, call the American Embassy uh, to see, and I'm sure he'll tell us the truth, to see if he made any effort to go see him. Uh, this, this has ramifications much, much broader than, uh, than just even this one case. But every individual, you know what? the Reagan people did and what Schultz did and others did with regard to Sharansky and Sakharov and uh, uh, and here we have an American citizen so uh, we're going to follow the case. Anyway, I thank you very much for your test testimony. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Sir. Panel. Uh, and then when Dr. George comes, we'll, we'll go to him.